God, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. God, help us to respond to you in faithfulness, to obey you with fervency, God, from a grateful heart. Lord, if there's anyone here that has not submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, has not abandoned their life of sin for Christ and turned and placed their faith and trust alone in Christ to save them, God, please, through your word, by your spirit, make them to come to know the weight of their sin. God, make them to know that which is fitting for those professing godliness, and may they turn to the only Savior, the only mediator, the only ransom, and be saved. God, for your glory, for your worship, for the good of their soul, God, save souls for your namesake. And we, Lord, as those who profess the name of Christ, God, may we be found faithful in living in such a way that gives testimony to the greatness, the goodness, the mercy, the kindness, the power of our Lord and Savior. For your everlasting praise, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. And our title this morning is Fit for Godliness. This is part two in our sermon series that we're working through 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we are working through this passage from verses 8 to 15. And we've titled the sermon Fit for Godliness because we're examining here from Paul's exhortation to Timothy those things in the life which accord with someone's profession of faith such that they are fit for godliness. And we get that primarily from verse 10. Now, last week, We basically looked at a foundation for what we're going to be talking about today and the weeks that come in this passage. The way that you dress expresses something and reflects something. It is an outward expression, if you will, of an inward reality. It reflects a deeper set of values that as Christians should reflect the values of Christ as found in God's revealed word. Through looking last week at adorning apparel, those two words specifically, we demonstrated from God's word, God's view of this. There is such a thing as showing yourself outwardly fit for godliness. How you live, how you dress even, communicates this. Now remember, last week, our beautifully set table. We've got a table, it is laid out, and imagine all the the place settings as we've talked about. Modesty, propriety, self-control. Not drawing attention to yourself, in that sense, humility, not pride. And in the the middle of this set table, we have a centerpiece that we find in verse 10. And verse 10 says this, but behave in a way or conduct yourself in a way which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. And we said that that is a challenge, if you will, a command from Paul to make sure that your profession Your profession in Christ, that word there meaning promise, your promise of godliness is in accord, is linked with every part of your life lived out. You are to live in such a way that is fitting for women professing godliness with good works. You're to be fit for godliness. Now that, we've said, applies to men as well. Men, you are to live in a way that is fitting for men professing or promising godliness with good works, you're to be fit for godliness. In other words, if you're making a claim, if you're making a profession of faith, you're saying that you're a Christian, you're a blood-bought brother or sister in Christ, then your whole life, every aspect of your life must be brought under the reality of that claim or that commitment or that promise that you're making. There is not a single aspect of your life that God is not concerned about, even here as we see the way that you dress. Every aspect of your life God is concerned about. It flows out of your heart and your nature. Now, we've said that God is concerned with the heart. That is biblically true. But where in Scripture God is concerned with outward expressions like dress, like the word that we used last week, deportment, where God is concerned with those things, God is concerned with that being an expression of the inward reality that rests in the heart. God is concerned about your heart, and in that, concerned about the way that you express your heart and the way that you hear, dress, or act. Now, this is nothing new in Scripture. The Bible says that you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. Although God looks at the heart, it says in 1 Samuel, he says in Ezekiel 36, that the nations will know that he is the Lord when he is hallowed in you before their eyes. 
In other words, God is concerned with your outward testimony to an onlooking lost world. Concerned with your outward life, your outward testimony, in the sense that it reflects the power of a changed life, the power of God to save a soul, to transform a sinner. He's concerned with His name and His glory. And you, claiming the name of Christ, claiming to be a Christian, are a walking testimony of His grace, a walking testimony of His power, a walking testimony of His attributes. And we're to properly reflect that in the way that we live. So here, in last week in verse 9, we looked at this issue of the outward expressions of those things, what that communicates. And in verse 9, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible says this, In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Now, the verse addresses women specifically, but men, as we've said, there is much here for you to apply, much here in principle that would apply to you as well that you need to uh, concern yourself with. Last week, specifically, looking at the concept of adornment or dress and apparel, or the clothing with which you dress, Adornment, we saw, meant to adorn, cosmane, meant to put or arrange in order, to be in proper order. Apparel, we looked at what that communicates, the way that you dress, what that communicates. It either communicates modesty and dignity, to conceal the body, in other words, or it demonstrates or communicates promiscuity or sexual availability. And in that sense, it's revealing the body, what they said was shameful advertising. So it's going to communicate one of those two things. It means to put in order or arrange things in order. Now remember, Paul's primary concerns here as we move forward. One, he's concerned with sexual purity in the church. Women in Ephesus at this time were displaying themselves sensually. And that is a problem. It causes distractions, causes disruptions in the church. And secondly, it causes damage or a corrupt testimony of God and of God saving the sinner. But two, the second primary concern that Paul has here is the women drawing attention to themselves or enticing or distracting or simply for just good old-fashioned pride. They just wanted to draw attention to themselves. The effects of this is that it caused disruption in the worship of the church at Ephesus and it caused damage to their testimony as blood-bought Christians. Uh, God is obviously concerned with both. But now keep in mind, even though we are communicating regarding outward apparel, the Holy Spirit is concerned primarily with the heart. And even in expressing the reality that how you dress affects your testimony, the Holy Spirit even chooses words that express that that is related to the inward heart of the person. We looked last week at that word katastale, which means the inward restraining of behavior, the inward restraint or the exercise of restraint specifically related to sexual immorality, that in how you dress, you express an inward restraint, uh, even though that word is talking about the outward clothing that they were wearing at the time. Uh, There's a restraint in attitude, a restraint in behavior, deportment, the word is, that there's a restraint in your mannerisms, in your manners, in your behavior. This is, again, closely connected, this outward deportment, closely connected with an inner set of values that we should have from the Word of God. Now, these two concepts, we've got inwardly fit for godliness and outwardly fit for godliness. These two concepts are intimately and inseparably linked You cannot have one without the other. They simply don't exist without the other. If you're strictly concerned with the outward, you're a legalist. That's going to come from the right heart, and it must come from the right heart. We need to be concerned about the heart. If the heart is right, the hemline is right, right? You need to be concerned with the heart, not the hemline initially. This is not unusual. This concept in Scripture is not unusual. In the same way that possession of genuinely, genuine saving faith is intimately and inseparably, inseparably linked with the fruits of genuine saving faith. In the same way here, the outward is linked to the inward. So now ask yourself in light of that truth, does what you wear reveal worldliness or godliness? That's an important point from this passage. Does how you conduct yourself, this applies to men and women, Both 
Does how you conduct yourself reveal worldliness or godliness? Does the way that you think, your reasoning, the way that you process and respond to Scripture, does it reveal worldliness or godliness? You're to be in accord with your profession of faith, fit, therefore, for godliness. Now, we looked first point last week at outwardly fit for godliness. Let's dig into verse 9 again this week and look at inwardly fit for godliness. The second point here in our series, inwardly fit for godliness. Here's what verse 9 says. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Now, verse 9 goes on to say, in modest apparel. We looked at that word apparel last week. The word modest is very informative with how we're to understand this. That's the word in Greek, cosmio. It's interesting. I love um, scripture in this sense. There's a word play here. Remember last week, to adorn, cosmain. Now we're looking at modest, cosmio. You would talk cosmain, cosmio. It's a word play that the Holy Spirit uses. If you're doing deep Bible study, you'll come across that. It's just the wisdom of God in writing scripture. But this word, cosmio, means appropriate or respectable. Appropriate or respectable. So in what way appropriate? Look at our dress. In what way are we to dress appropriately? You're to dress appropriately in the sense, this is a word that reflects the internal heart of the person. You're to dress in the sense, or be appropriate in the sense, that your outward dress reflects the inward reality. In other words, that which is fitting for women professing godliness. It's dress that is appropriate to your profession of faith. It's what appropriate or respectable means there. We've made the point that when the heart is right, everything else will fall in place. It's the heart that God is concerned about. Therefore, your dress is a reflection of your heart, an outward expression of an inward reality. C.J. Mahaney, is where we got that quote from, uh, in a discussion of biblical modesty, said that you start by addressing the heart, not the hemline. You address the heart, right? Now, three concepts in verse 9 do just that. Three concepts from verse 9 are going to inform us or, or give us understanding of what our hearts are to reflect here. One, shamefacedness. It's a King James word. In your New King James, it's translated propriety. In your ESV, it's translated modesty. I love the King James word, shamefacedness. It's an expressing of shame, and we're going to talk about that at length this morning and, and unpack that. The second concept given here in verse 9 is self-control. You're to respond with shamefacedness. You're to respond with self-control. And the last word there is selflessness. Selflessness. You're to dress. You're to comport yourself. You're to behave with selflessness. Now, if you notice, three S's, right? Shamefacedness, self-control, selfless. These are the three S's of biblical modesty, according to God's word. Uh, so consider every S before you dress. It's a good way to think about it. Consider your S's before you dresses, right? Um, these S's, or the way that you dress, should reflect your heart. It's going to be an expression of your heart, all right? So let's unpack this word, shamefacedness, eidos in the Greek. This is the first word we come across, this word propriety in the New King James. George Knight, commentator, said this, the state of mind, shamefacedness, is the state of mind or attitude of heart necessary for one to be concerned about modesty. That attitude there that he's referring to is the attitude of shame. Now, we need to get an understanding of this, okay? Shamefacedness is the state of mind or attitude of heart necessary for one to be concerned about modesty. In that sense now, it is an awareness or an understanding of the feelings of another, maybe a brother or sister, the Lord himself. An understanding or awareness about the feelings or opinions of another person in response to your own conscience, okay? In that sense, if your own conscience, let me give you an example, your own conscience grieves you over something you say, something you do, a sin that you commit against a brother or against a sister, your conscience in responding to the shame of sin will prevent that shameful act from happening again, right? It's that thought, that understanding of your actions, your thoughts, your words, your deeds that are shameful, that precedes and then prevents a shameful act from happening. So in that sense, that shame is a healthy shame. 
If you've acted shamefully, you feel the weight of that in your conscience, you take into consideration what another brother, what the Lord thinks of that, and it prevents you or keeps you from entertaining that shameful act again, all right? It's intended to keep you, that shame, that grieving conscience, is intended to keep you from crossing a boundary, from transgressing, as the Bible says, uh, or straying into an action that would be shameful. That concept, now if you think about it, is necessary. It is very necessary and very helpful in helping us to avoid situations which are shameful, avoid situations which are sinful. We need that pure, healthy, sensitive conscience to assist us in that, okay? Now, therefore, modesty knows where that boundary is and because of the attitude of shamefacedness or the attitude of shame, modesty will keep you from participating or dressing in such a way that is immodest or shameful. Immodesty is shameful. Modesty is that which stays away from shame, uh, has the attitude of shamefacedness. Now, it's not shame, ladies, in being a woman. Guys, it's not shame in being a good-looking guy or a muscular guy. It's not shame in being a man. But here, it is shame, specifically in enticing another person sensually or being a distraction or eliciting lust from a brother, from a sister, in the way that you conduct yourself, in the way that you dress. Uh, it includes here, in verse 9, both the inference to sexual enticement and the extravagance that is a distraction to the body, all right? Now, again, in context, and I want us to understand this and how these two things fit together, these concepts fit together, because it's very important when it comes to understanding modesty in the context here. A woman would be so grieved over even the possibility of enticing someone to lust or causing distraction in the body with the way that she dresses in other words, placing a stumbling block before her brother, placing a stumbling block, guys, before your sister, or offending God, you'd be so grieved over even the possibility of that that you respond to the possibility of that with great care, with great fear of God, such that you dress modestly. Can you see the connection between the possibility of shame? You have the attitude of shamefacedness such that it keeps you from placing a stumbling block before your brother or offending God. It is acting, in that sense, with prudence. It is acting with good deportment in your behavior, in your mannerisms. Jeff Pollard says this. I like this. Her dress, ladies, will not communicate sex, pride, or money, but your dress will communicate purity, humility, and moderation. It's a good way to think about it. Now, guys, again, this can happen the same way for you. Your dress the way that you behave, the way that you conduct yourself, will not, if you're a Christian and you're living in such a way that is fitting for godliness, you will not communicate sex, pride, or money, but purity, humility, and moderation. Shame, then, if you think about it this way, is a matter of the heart, isn't it? Shame is a matter of the heart. It's internal. Now, that same attitude should govern all of your actions as a Christian. Right? That same attitude should be a governing force for all of your actions as a Christian. Uh, a fear, a healthy biblical fear of offending or disobeying the Lord. A healthy biblical fear of laying a stumbling block before your brother, causing him to stumble. Now think about this, men and women both. Here we're specifically talking about dress, but this applies, doesn't it, to your mannerisms, to your speech, the way that you joke or interact with one another. Your tongue, James 3.8 3, says that the tongue is an unruly evil. Is your communication, is your joking around, is your interaction with the brothers and sisters or with lost people in the world, is it flavored, is that seasoned with a healthy fear of God, with a healthy sense of shamefacedness, or is that something that would be worthy of shame? or offensive to God, or placing a stumbling block before your brother or sister. Think about the way that you jest or jab with a loved one, a blood-brought brother or sister in Christ. Um, what about the exercise of your so-called liberties? What would that, think about it, what would that social drink communicate to potential onlookers? 
brothers and sisters in Christ, all, all of what you perceive to be Christian liberties are brought to be brought under the submission to the Word of God, under submission to these guiding principles that you will do nothing to bring reproach on Christ or to put a stumbling block before your brother. Romans 14, 21 says this, It is good, it is good, neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. To Paul, that liberty that he may have liked was not worth causing his brother to stumble. And it never is. If you're grasping on to some perceived liberty that you have, and in that liberty you'll cause your brother to stumble, you don't have a right to that liberty, according to God's Word. Submit your liberties to loving your brother. It goes on to say in verse, uh, four, uh, chapter 14 that if you do it anyway and your brother is grieved, then you're no longer walking in love. Can you see how unloving that is? That's going to become very important, that concept, in the choices that you make, ladies and guys, with respect to how you dress and how you conduct yourself. It is loving to submit yourself to problems that your brother may have with the way you dress, or the way that you talk, or the way that you act, or the way that you live. It goes on to say, Paul says, do not destroy with your liberty the one for whom Christ died. We're to care for our brother. We're to love our brother. This certainly applies to dress. So where does this godly, this is godly, this is biblical, where does this godly sense of shame come from? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Where does this godly sense of shame come from? Genesis chapter 2, and let's look together beginning in verse 23. This is Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Now, God brings Eve into the picture, and right off the bat, uh, Adam is smitten with Eve. I mean, it's like love at first sight. He is taken beside himself right now, (laughs) and so he breaks out into this, this praise, if you will, of God's decision here to bring, to bring Eve about in verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now in the beginning... Here before the fall, nakedness was not shameful. Nakedness wasn't shameful. Uh, God made them that way, and he proclaimed everything to be very good. There was no reason here for shame, no reason here for humiliation. So where did it all go wrong? I mean, what happened to take something from being good and right very good, as God says, no cause for shame, no cause for humiliation, and now for it to go so bad? Look down at chapter 3, verse 6. At this point, sin enters the picture. And as sin enters, shame follows. Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings. Here, sin enters, shame follows sin. Understanding of sin, knowledge of sin, attentiveness to sin, sensitivity to sin, all of that came through the fall here, through their disobedience, and with that understanding, with that attentiveness to sin, came shame came guilt, came this conscience, right? Came humiliation. With sin comes that understanding of shame and humiliation, all right? But look down at verse 9. Now, their response to this was to make themselves coverings. There in verse 11, they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves. I'm sorry, that's verse 7. They sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves coverings. Literally there, it means loincloth or apron, They made themselves coverings with fig leaves. Now, we're going to find out this is small and insufficient uh, for what needed to be done. We'll see that as we go. Look at verse 9 now. 
Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. And this is interesting. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God calls out to Adam. Adam and Eve, after the sin, had made loincloths for themselves. Then after, when God calls out to Adam, he hides himself, even covered with loincloths, because as Adam said, he was naked and I hid myself. So God responds in verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of the, of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God goes right to his obedience, right to the heart, sort of steps over the whole issue of nakedness for a moment. But here again, Adam, even with the fig leaves sewn around him, considered himself naked and he hid himself from God. Their own knowledge of sin brought shame, brought humiliation instantly. Their thoughts reflected this awareness. Have you, in your life, if you're professing to be a Christian, has your conscience become dulled or insensitive to sin such that you don't feel shame anymore? Or that you don't feel this awareness of humiliation, how your sin causes shame, or how your sin offends God? how your sin might be perceived by your brother or sister. In the world today, we've heard this said before, that we've forgotten how to blush. The world today is in this downward slide from generation to generation of undressing itself in public. And there's no shame associated with that. There's no humiliation associated with that. We revel in it. The culture today revels in this. We've forgotten how to blush. We've forgotten how to be ashamed of sin. You've got to cultivate a sensitive conscience with respect to your sin. And you cultivate that by informing it from God's Word. And we have to be sensitive to sin. Now look at what God did. We've got this response on the part of Adam and Eve. And we see them respond to this awareness, this shame, uh, this humiliation in covering themselves with these loincloths. But look at God's response in chapter 3, verse 21. God comes along and he says, also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, notice the contrast here. They sewed fig leaves together to basically cover their private parts, all right, in response to their shame, in response to their humiliation, in response to their sin. And even then, still feeling uncovered, still feeling naked, they hid themselves still from God. God comes along now, doesn't make them fig leaf coverings. He covers them with a tunic, tunics of skin, animal hide. And he clothed, it says there, them, literally means covered them. Now this tunic, this was a shirt-like garment. It would have been close around the neck and it would have gone to at least below the knees. Men wore these oftentimes but just below the knee for the purposes of work, so they could work in them. If it were a situation where you're going to be in mixed company or for ladies, they would wear them to their, to their ankles, to the ground. It would have gone neck to knees at least, neck to ground usually. Often for men working, they were sleeveless. Ladies would have had long sleeves. Men often would have had long sleeves. It would have been made of linen mostly and would have laid next to the skin. There would have been clothes even over that. It was considered and called often in Scripture a coat or a robe. That's what those words mean. It was a normal garment. Both men and women wore this garment, and here, made of animal skin. This was not a fur bikini. <laughs> this was a coat, a robe of animal hide from neck to knees at least, okay? And this was the normal the normal. Garment. Adam and Eve covered their private parts. God, it is important to understand, covered their bodies. God concealed the body. And that is in response to sin, to shame, to humiliation. That's in a response to this attitude of shame facedness, okay? Now, this garment continued into the first century, thousands of years. Even in the first century, this was common. Remember the parable of the prodigal son and the father who coming off the porch to go and greet his son had to lift up his garment so that he could run. And that was considered what? Shameful to do that. For him to lift up his garment was shameful. For a man going into battle, he had to gird up his loins. Well, what did that mean? 
he took that long garment, often down to the knees, and he had to wrap it up around him, tie it in his belt so that he could fight, so this thing wasn't getting tangled up in his legs. This is a long garment. This same word, this same word, the same concept, is used of God clothing the priests in the tabernacle in the wilderness in Exodus 28. He clothed them with this long floor-length garment and then put a robe or a coat over them. Uh, And it was that garment that the priests were to wear. And even then, gave them specific instructions that as they were walking up the steps into the tabernacle or walking up onto a platform to speak, they were very careful to, as the Bible says, to conceal their nakedness so that someone would look up and accidentally see something they shouldn't see. Their nakedness would be revealed. Now, when's the last time you thought about that as you were going up the stairs or going up an escalator in a skirt, ladies? That's something that God himself in his word calls shameful. It's shameful. The priests were clothed this way. In Revelation 6, those saints under the altar were given a white robe, a white robe. They were clothed in white linen robe. Again, this is the standard here. Now, why is this the standard? We see this in God clothing Adam and Eve, in God clothing the priests, in God clothing the people of Israel for all these thousands of years, for God even giving this clothing to those saints under the altar in heaven in Revelation 6. Why is this The standard is because the principle in Scripture that we must, if we're going to be faithful to God and faithful to God's Word, the principle in Scripture that we are to to apply with respect to clothing ourselves is that clothing is for the purpose of concealing the body, not revealing the body. Very clear from Scripture. Clothing is to conceal the body, not to reveal the body. Now, you're not going to find in Scripture a prescription for exactly how you're to dress. Wear this kind of material, wear it this long, not this long, but this long. Make sure it covers here, not here. I mean, it's, you're not going to find a prescription uh, like that. However, Scripture is extremely clear that our dress is very important to God as an outward expression of an inward reality. And so how do you avoid then, without specifics, you've got this principle, how do you avoid then being immodest? What do you do to keep yourself from a shameful situation of dressing immodestly? Well, what you do is you look for principles in Scripture, and this is a good way to consider your Bible study with your Christian liberties. You look for principles in Scripture that communicate God's intention for these things, specifically here for modesty, and you apply those principles to what you do. You're going to make decisions about your dress, guys or gals. You make decisions about your dress, you apply principles from Scripture. You apply that to what you do. You apply it to the decisions that you make. So what is the principle here with respect to modesty? It, modesty is to conceal the body. The body is to be covered, not to be revealed. Now, the reverse of this we can see also in Scripture is also true, and it helps inform our understanding of this. It was shameful in Scripture to uncover or even fail to cover enough the body. We see that in multiple places. In Isaiah chapter 47, verse 3, the Bible says this, Isaiah 47, 3, Your nakedness shall be uncovered, yes, your shame will be seen. This was an act of God in judging the nation of Israel, and he uses this as an illustration. And he ties dress with shame here again, nakedness with shame. In Ezekiel 16, verse 37, Surely, therefore, God says, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved, all those you hated. I will gather them from all around against you and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. Again, in God's mind, nakedness is shameful. Nahum chapter 3, verse 5. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face And I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Again, nakedness tied to shame. Now, in the New Testament, when you removed this outer garment and you were just down to your inner garment, literally the word that was used there was without clothes. 
Peter described himself when he took his outer garment off to fish, described himself against John 21, described himself as naked, simply getting down to his inner garment, and that inner garment from neck to knees, and he considered himself still naked. And this garment, you got to understand, would have covered them far better than the swimwear of today, right? And it was considered shameful. It was considered naked to be in that garment alone. Consider this for a moment. That which even today would be shameful to walk around in downtown or shameful to go into a store with or shameful to come to church with, shameful to pump the gas in, shameful to work in your yard in, shameful to hang around with other people in, in social settings, is okay and is acceptable and even considered appropriate as long as you're on the sand near the water. It doesn't make sense, right? It's, it's, it's worldly reasoning. You got to understand that our culture impacts the way that we think about these things. Um, it, Many years ago, you would have been arrested for indecent exposure for that which has become completely acceptable today. You see the ledge from which we have fallen. This is the downward slide of our culture. This simply, this idea, is simply against what the Scripture clearly reveals as being the principle here with respect to modesty, that we are to conceal the body, not reveal the body. The fashion industry is not concerned with concealment. The fashion industry is all about revealing. The fashion industry's main objective, you read their literature, their main object ob objective is to cultivate sexual attraction. That is the purpose of their clothing for the most part, is to cultivate sexual attraction by revealing. It's exactly opposite, exactly counter. Paul's concern with Ephesus in 1 Timothy chapter 2, especially here in verse 9, is that the clothing that was being worn is sexually enticing. And you go anywhere, that's the clothing that you see. 1 John 2.15 says that we're not to love the world or the things of the world. If we love the world, the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in us. It is a standing opposed to that which God loves, okay? I heard this quote, brother reminded me of this from, from Paul Washer. That was an extremely good way to think about this. If your clothing is a frame for your body, then it is sensual and God hates it because it's shameful. But if your clothing is a frame for your face, or your clothing reflects godly character, godly concern for God's glory and your brother's safety or your sister's safety, men, then that is clothing that God would be pleased with. Uh, we have to consider these things as we consider Scripture with respect to how we dress, all right? Now, consider this next, um, the shame of revealing the body. Uh, here are, then, the motivations for that. People dress this way. The fashion industry pushes this to draw attention to yourself and to entice, to elicit, elicit a sensual response. Uh, men, think about the effects that your dress has on ladies. Uh, if you're wearing, you take your shirt off, <laughs> or you're wearing tight clothing, this has an impact on the ladies too. Ladies, am I speaking out of turn? It has an impact on the ladies too. You got your underwear hanging out of your pants. Underwear is underwear, not outerwear. Or you're making, you're making decisions with respect to how you dress that can impact ladies. But ladies, certainly, this is tough for you. This is something that really impacts the guys. And I'm convinced that most women just simply don't understand the reality of how this impacts a guy. Um, just don't see it or don't understand it. You have to take our word for it. it. It has an impact, okay? And I want you to see the effects that your clothing choices have on men around you. I saw this, and I thought this was very uh, appropriate for describing this. And this is a young man who, like many men, struggle in this area, battling sin and wanting to serve the Lord, wanting to be faithful to the Lord in this area. Here's what he says. He's on a college campus. Each and every day on campus is a battle. It's a battle against my sin, a battle against temptation, a battle against my depraved mind. Listen, if you're, 
in school, young men, uh, you're on a campus, old men, if you're walking around and you're not battling this, um, you're not engaged in fighting this sin, very, very, very likely you are deep in this sin already. Uh, you need to be battling. This is the right attitude to have. It's a battle, okay? Fight sin. Every morning, he says, I have to cry out to God for mercy, for strength and a renewed conviction to flee youthful lusts. The Spirit is faithful to bring me the renewal I need to prepare me to do war against my sin, yet the temptation still exists. I'm thankful God has created me to be attracted to women. However, campus is a loaded minefield. There are girls everywhere, and I'm guaranteed to pass some attractive girls as I walk to my classes. To make it through the day unscathed, I have to be actively engaging my mind, praying, quoting scripture, listening to worship music, or looking at the sidewalk. Many days it takes all four to be safe. And you imagine this guy, you know, walking around campus, mumbling to himself with his head down. It's like that kind of, you know, that guy. It's like, he's just, and I'm just trying to stay alive, man. You know, I'm like trying to battle this sin. The thing women do not seem to fully grasp, he says, is that the temptation toward lust does not stop. It is continual. It is aggressive. It does all it can to lead men down to death. They have a choice to help or deter its goal. Sometimes when I see a girl provocatively dressed, I'll say to myself, she probably doesn't know that 101 guys are going to devour her in their minds today. Ladies, that is the reality. That is the unvarnished truth. You dress provocatively, that's the result. That's, that's the result. But then again, he says, maybe she does know. To be honest, I don't know the truth. The truth of why she chooses to dress the way she does. All I know is that the way she presents herself to the world is bait for my sinful mind to latch onto, and I need to avoid it at all costs. Now, I've talked to ladies. What are you thinking about when you pay, take that shirt off the rack, or you're trying on jeans, or you're looking at a dress? Women know. Some women don't. A lot of times when they're making choices about what they wear, they know exactly what reaction that's going to elicit, and they're looking for that reaction. You understand that is godless. That is sensual. God hates it. Be careful. Consider the Lord and consider your brother. Guys, same thing. Consider the choices that you make with respect to dress and how that's going to affect those around you. It says here, it goes on, for the most part, the church serves as a sanctuary from the continual barrage of temptation towards sin. However, the church's members are not free from sin yet, and there are girls, those who are ignorant and those who are knowledgeable of men's sinful tendencies, who dress immodestly. I must confess that even church can have several minds scattered about. To the girls who are ignorant, please serve your brothers in Christ and have your dad screen your wardrobe. Ask him how you can better choose holiness over worldliness. He's a guy, and he knows more about the temptation men's face, men face than you do. And to the girls who don't follow the pattern of the world, thank you a million times over. You are following Scripture's commands and are helping your brothers in the process. Despite all that godly men are doing to defeat the sin of lust, they still need help, and they need you to provide it. It's a man struggling in his battle with sin. Here's another perspective. I want us to understand this. As Christian women in the church, you can be either a blessing or a distraction, this man says, as the second young man explains. The one place where I might think I, I wouldn't have to face as much temptation is at church, but this is not always the case. When women that I'm friends with dress immodestly, it definitely has a negative effect on our friendship. When a woman dresses immodestly, it doesn't make it easy to see her as a sister in Christ. There's a constant battle going on as I'm talking to her. Communication becomes more difficult because as I'm trying to listen to her, I'm also trying to fight temptation. I think some women aren't aware that even little things can distract guys a lot, showing even a little part of their stomach. Now listen to this in terms of a trigger that a guy would have and receive with meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your soul, showing even a little part of their stomach. Wearing bags that have straps that go between their breasts and so on. It's even those little things that are problematic, right? I'm so grateful for the friendships God has given me with the godly women in my church. 
I'm so appreciative of the sacrifices they make in order to glorify God and serve and care for the guys. I heard of one girl who went shopping and really liked the shirt that she was trying on, but then she thought, no, I can't do this to the guys. That was the first time I'd ever heard of anything like that, and it made me so grateful. It is such a blessing to have friends who care for me enough to be selfless and to sacrifice what might look attractive in order to help me and other guys with sexual lusts. When women dress modestly, it's attractive, and it makes me want to hang out with them more. I think modesty is so attractive and helpful in friendships because it makes it easier for a friendship to be centered around God and for fellowship to be unhindered. When your clothing draws attention to yourself or elicits a sensual response, the attention is no longer on God. The attention is on you. And it's sensual. And it's, according to Scripture, it's shameful. It's shameful. This all needs to be wrapped into our understanding of shamefacedness. This first word, propriety in your New King James, modesty in your ESV, all of this informs our understanding of that word. What should be your response? How are you to respond to this? What is the state of your heart concerning this right now? This is clear. This is definitive in Scripture. God intends to cover the body, to conceal the body, not reveal the body. Where's your heart right now with respect to that? Are you battling God in your mind and in your heart with respect to your self-willed choices when it comes to your dress? Or will you humble yourself to God and honor God in the way that you dress? Honor God in your deportment, your behavior, your mannerisms. Is there an appropriate concern for God or is there more concern for your self-willed rebellion in this, wanting to do what you want to do, wanting to dress how you want to dress and not considering these things. God is so concerned with this that he places scripture after scripture in the Bible related to this. Think about this line of questioning for yourself or anyone else that you may need to talk to regarding this subject. This is important to think about. Here's a good line of questioning. Number one, do you, young woman, young man, have at least somewhat of an understanding of the struggle, specifically for ladies ladies here, that men face with respect to lust? Do you at least have somewhat of an understanding of the struggle that men face with respect to lust? The second question would be, if you answer that in the affirmative, I understand that men struggle with it. Number two, do you believe then that you have some responsibility before the Lord to ensure that you do not do anything to cause your brother to stumble? And if you understand from Scripture that that's true, and you do have responsibility for that, then question number three, do you believe then that what you are wearing adequately and faithfully reflects that understanding and responsibility? You understand the struggle. You understand the potential of the possibility for sin, right? Then you understand from the Word of God that I have to be careful not to place a stumbling block in front of someone else to cause them to sin, You have that understanding, you see that responsibility, then put yourself under that principle. Is what I am wearing adequately and faithfully reflecting that understanding and my responsibility? And in that, you'll avoid this issue of shame with respect to immodesty. It flows out of the heart of a sister, out of a brother who loves the Lord and loves his brother, loves her brother, all right? It's important for this to be understood by fathers as well. You have daughters that you need to be concerned about. Important for husbands because God has made you responsible for your wife. And so you're to understand this for your daughters, for your wife. Ladies, if you're not sure, ask your father. Ask your husband. Ask an older lady in the church. Husbands, take responsibilities for your wife. Take responsibility for your daughters. Next in verse 9, back in 1 Timothy chapter 2 here, At the end of verse 9, Paul gets somewhat specific here, and he gives specific examples of extravagance that causes a distraction in the church, causes a distraction to your testimony, to being fit for godliness, and he gets specific. At the end of verse 9, he says that you, with propriety and moderation, he says, don't dress with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. That's not giving you specific examples of jewelry 
or specific examples of hairstyles, but it is more specific. It's giving you an understanding of what he's talking about here. Well, let us get specific with, re- re- with reference to this principle. The principle in Scripture is clothing is to conceal the body, not to reveal the body, okay? So if we're to look at that principle and we're to begin to put things in place to apply that principle to what we dress, here are going to be three things that you need to consider. One, consider the clothing that is intended to reveal body parts or to imply revealed body parts. For example, plunging necklines, lowly buttoned shirts, got your shirt unbuttoned too, too, too far, showing cleavage, short skirts. Notice that I'm not saying how short or how long. You've got to apply these principles to the choices that you make, but know that the purpose or the principle of God in Scripture is to conceal the body, not to reveal the body. Short skirts that reveal, or short shirts that reveal the midriff, reveal your back. Short skirts or dresses, low-rise skirts or low-rise pants. Strapless, it may reveal too much flesh. Sheer clothing of any kind meant to reveal the body. Now that's obviously or overtly revealing the body, Consider this, point number two, that which reveals the body through shape or through contour. In other words, really tight jeans, tight pants, workout clothes are chronic for this. Are you revealing the body or concealing the body? Point three or principle three to consider, revealing revealing the body in such a way that gives rise to sensual imagination long slits in a skirt, underwear, or your bra showing. Underwear that should be underwear that is turning into outerwear, it causes people to think. It causes sensual imagination, Um, either outside, like undergarments showing through your clothing, or through sheer clothing. You can see through the clothing and see underwear. It should be underwear. Um, Underwear used as outerwear. Nowadays, Women wear bustiers, like that was a very provocative undergarment just a few years ago, and now it's worn in public outwardly. Uh, Underwear is underwear, not outerwear. (laughs) Guys can do this too, right? Guys are guilty of these things too. Um, These are things that you need to consider as you consider obeying the Lord in this principle from Scripture. The principle is that the body is to be concealed, not revealed, all right? Going on, we have two more points in one minute. We have um, in in, in verse 9, the next issue to consider here is, um, in verse 9, is self-control. The Bible says in verse 9, with propriety, that's that word shamefacedness, and moderation. That word there, moderation, is self-control. You've got to consider every yes before you dress. Self-control means discretion or sexually prudent. Proverbs 11.22 says, as a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a lovely woman who lacks discretion. Uh, Titus 2, 12, it's translated soberly, where the Bible says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Galatians 5, the self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Here, it forms a bookend on our passage. It's mentioned self-control in verse 9, and it's mentioned self-control in verse 15. They'll continue, these ladies, in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Self-control is self-governance. It's a mastery of your physical appetites or desires. Uh, It's a vigilance or a diligence over those desires. In other words, here, consider the, the cause of this dress on the part of these ladies in Ephesus. They wanted to draw attention to themselves. They wanted to entice men sexually, and that comes from the root of pride. Self-control is governing or mastering that appetite that you have in your flesh for pride. Say, I'm not going to give in to that. I'm going to control that appetite, and I'm going to live godly. I'm going to be inwardly and outwardly fit for godliness and dress in such a way that is fitting for women who profess godliness with good works. It's controlling that. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 27, Paul says, I discipline my body, bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. It takes self-control. The next issue here in verse 9 is selflessness. 
He goes into specifics, says not to dress with braided hair, gold, pearls, or costly clothing. What he's saying there is don't dress in a way that you are drawing attention to yourself uh, and thereby distracting others. In that sense, you're being selfless in the way that you dress, considering the Lord, considering your brother, considering your sister. Here, this is clothing that wealthy women in Ephesus used to exalt themselves. The story about the emperor Caligula, who had a wife, his name, her name was uh, Junia. And Junia dressed in a dress and this hairdo, uh, all stacked up on her head with jewels and stuff put in there, and this dress with pearls and emeralds and jewelry hanging from this dress. She would wear this dress all over the place, and the dress was literally, in today's, dollar, in today's dollars, was a million-dollar dress. It was a million dollars. And she would carry with her the appraisal of the dress so that she could show people, I'm wearing a million-dollar dress. You know, I've got a million-dollar hairdo. I look like a million bucks. It, it, was just a, it was a way to draw attention to herself, to, to, to distract, to fuel her pride, her ego. We're not a dress that way. Our dress should reflect humility, should reflect prudence. Does this mean that you come to church drab? Or you wear your 15-year-old sweats to everywhere you go? Or your frumpy house coat everywhere you go? i got to be in a coat. It's my outer garment. You know? No, it's not what this is saying. The Bible says well-ordered, well-arranged. So you're to take joy. Is it, is it sinful to be beautiful? No. Be beautiful. It, be well-arranged. Be well-ordered. You're to do that. That shows honor to the Lord. That's a that's a beautiful thing to do, right? To adorn yourself that way. But what it's not saying is don't do anything sinful with it. Don't draw undue attention to yourself. Don't exalt yourself in your pride. Don't elicit other people sensually or sexually. Uh, do that which is fitting for women professing godliness and good works. Um, you are to dress beautifully and to take care of yourself. And ladies, you're to do that for your husband. Husband, you're to do that for your wife. Uh, that's the right thing to do. Here, this self-control and this selflessness is rebuked in four ways. One, hairstyles, two examples of jewelry, and then lastly, expensive clothing. Hairstyles, does it mean here, ladies, that you can't braid your hair? No. You can't braid your hair. No, that's not right. You can braid your hair. It means that this, these elaborate, expensive hairstyles that, again, drew attention, that exalted themselves in their wealth. You think about it now. If you dress wealthily like that in, a, in an effort to exalt yourself, draw attention to yourself, immediately you divide yourself from the poor people in the church. You can't dress that way. From those women who are professing godliness who are really concerned about these things, you divide yourself from them who think that you shouldn't dress that way because it's not in accord with God's Word. It causes division. It causes disruption in the body. That's what it was doing here in Ephesus. Then he gives two examples of jewelry. Jewelry, this time extravagant jewelry, was epitomized by sumptuousness. Uh, it was regarded as emblematic of shameful women. Uh, Juvenal said that there's nothing that a woman won't do who adorns herself with emeralds encircling her neck. It's like it was a, a symbol of shame, right? And then it's expensive clothing, drawing attention uh, to yourself. This can be done in many ways, right? If you walk through the mall and you see someone who is the goth, Thing going on, right? Hair, all kinds of different ways, all kinds of different colors. Um, looks like uh, one of those crazed rock stars with the face, the face paint going on, the nails, the clothing, the chains, the tattoos. I, it's just a way of drawing attention to yourself. It simply is a fueling of pride. It's simply a drawing of attention. All of that is not in keeping with that which is fitting for godliness, okay? 1 Peter 3 Verses 3 and 4 says this, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. We've got to allow our definition or our understanding of beauty to inform, be informed by God's definition or God's understanding of beauty. Here, God tells you exactly what that is. Does it mean you can't wear jewelry? Absolutely not. The principle here is don't draw attention to yourself. Undue attention to yourself. Don't feel your pride. Uh, don't cause distraction or disruption. Certainly, you can wear jewelry. Certainly, you can braid your hair. 
certainly you can have hairstyles. It's nice. Just don't step over the bounds of transgressing against the Lord with respect to the three S's, shamefacedness, self-control, and selflessness. Consider every S before you dress. In all things, we are to, are to adorn the doctrine of God with your godly life, with your godly decisions, with your godly choices. Avoid anything, avoid anything that is shameful, that which reflects a lack of self-control or that which draws attention away from the Lord and places that attention on yourself. We're to honor the Lord in these things. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you, God, for the, the pure, simple, clear teaching of your word on even this subject, God, which is so practical, so appropriate to everyday life and choices, God, and find us faithful, Lord, to submit ourselves entirely in all of these choices to our Lord and to walk in a way that is worthy of the calling with which you've called us, that is honoring to the Lord, that is a glorious testimony to those around us of your power to save, of your glorious mercy and grace which transforms a wicked sinful heart that once was just running in debauchery with the current of this world, but that now God is deeply concerned with holiness and righteousness and serving the Lord and faithfully representing Him as a, a child of the kingdom. Uh, may we be faithful in these things. Lord, protect us from hard-heartedness with respect to these issues. God, protect us from pride self-will when it comes to these issues. God, author in us, God, a humble heart to simply humble ourselves and to obey you and to show out of a grateful heart, out of a transformed heart, our love for you, even in the way that we dress and conduct ourselves, our mannerisms, our behavior, our deportment, for your glory, God, as trophies of your grace who will forever worship you in eternity and for your great namesake among the nations. We pray all these things in the blessed name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.